able to be used on here. Yeah, but it's a very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's less. No, no, your your computer yeah, person. Oh, there. Yeah, it's, it's a little laggy. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, because okay. it's a little bit laggy. Thank you. Fair enough. Hey, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how it's properly supposed to work, but that's how I always do it. So is this Conan, the AV guy? Right, let's go up here. I think we can do that. Okay. Fantastic, guys. So uh, I think we're good. So you got, oh, and I need to turn this on. So is the microphone on? I have a, um, I've got a bit of a head cold, or I had a head cold about 10 days ago, and I'm getting over it. I, so I sound pretty horrible, but I feel much better. <laughs> so apologies uh, for any coughing, and I promise it uh, sounds worse than it, than it is, and I feel. Uh, my name is Ian Tong, I'm Chief Medical Officer at Doctor on Demand. Uh, I'm actually a clinical assistant professor here at Stanford. I taught here in the medical school now for 12, I guess 11 years, still, still 11 years, um, getting up there though. And um, how many of you are in the medical school? Okay, so a few of you are medical students. Um, I used to be an E4C faculty, so I was one of the original E4C faculty, had, a, had my own group. Um, they're doing well. Most of them have now graduated, but it is Stanford, so a number of them are still are still here um, and enjoying enjoying the friendly confines of Stanford campus. Um, and call, call it talk today, we're into primary care, and um, that it, that name and, uh, is really um, is really the space that this was called. Doctor Man went into about four years ago. It was called the Reinvent Primary Care Space. It was a hot space for investors. They wanted to get in it. The whole idea there was the acknowledgement that healthcare needed disruption, um, which is a very common word here, uh, but not as common maybe in the Philippines or elsewhere, um, but one that, um, that we use in Silicon Valley a lot uh, for industries that have gotten very used to uh, their, their sort of status quo of the way that they do business. And, um, and so for most people who are involved in healthcare, which is almost everybody if you think about it, from everybody, everybody's a patient or a provider or a decision maker in their household, or in some way engages the healthcare system, um, all of those people have at some point come to the conclusion that this is a little bit painful to actually access the system, engage a doctor, get seen, um, it's not very convenient, and so we'll talk a little bit about some of those factors. Uh, does, has anybody here heard about Doctor on Demand before? Are you guys aware of Doctor on Demand as a company? A couple people, but mostly not. So I will give, I'll give some brief overview of it. Um, and we'll see how this works through the presentation. Um, I'll try to do that so that you guys are, are able to follow along, um, especially those who are international um, who may have less of an idea. So the goal, we'll talk a little bit about the industry. I already did a little bit of that, but, um, but really telemedicine itself, itself. And then talk a little bit about uh, the patient experience. And I think that's something that, have you guys heard that phrase before, patient experience? Is, is it more common now? Because I never heard it all the way through medical school. I never heard it all the way through residency. We never talked about it um, through, you know, my early faculty years. Um, it wasn't until I actually left Stanford and joined um, Dr. On Demand that we started talking about experience in general. And that's everything from what is, you know, what is the, what's the patient side of this equation look like and feel like? Um, I was, you know, I was pretty attuned and maybe uh, tone deaf. Uh, I was attuned to what the doctor's side of this equation was and the care provider side was. A bit tone deaf, I would say, to what the other side of the equation was from the patient side. Um, I, mean, I, I thought I considered myself a fairly uh, empathic physician, so I did think about it. But um, but but until you're a patient, I think it's very difficult to, to actually really truly experience the patient. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a patient uh, perspective. Uh, so. uh, we'll talk about quality a little bit as well. So I know this is I have some slides, but I, I honestly. I encourage questions, but I think that I, the goal is that I would go through 30 minutes, so maybe another 20 minutes of talking at you guys, and then we would pause, and then you, have, you all would be able to spend 20 minutes asking questions. Is that the normal way it's going? Yes. That's good. Okay. All right, so this is just a point to the industry itself and what's happening. So, um, every, uh, so on, the, on the right side of this curve, it shows you that the adoption of iOS and Android devices. You guys have probably seen this now, and you guys are very attuned to it. Um, it's definitely something that's taken maybe a little bit more time for me to get used to. Um, but the, the whole thought of, well, you've got to remember in 2007, neither of those two devices that have that really high adoption of like the iOS and Android devices, those didn't exist. So right around the time that I started, or just after I started my faculty career, there was no such thing as an iPhone and all the applications that go on all of those. So 
Um, but I was involved in telemedicine at that time in 2007. It was done very differently with large devices, very expensive screens, cameras, you know, that were high def that could focus on the back on this wall in high definition. Um, very expensive equipment that could do a number of things, but nobody was actually using it. Um, most of all, patients weren't using it. There was no adoption on the patient side. But since the emergence of the iPhone and uh, um, and all the other phones that support the Android I, uh, operating system, huge adoption on that side. And then so just where does that leave us now? This article came out of last year. That's an article um, that does a few quotations of different uh, Kaiser CEOs and really points to the fact that Kaiser itself has trans uh, trans really transformed their health system to one that is relying much more heavily on uh, digital, either synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous being what we're doing right now, asynchronous being uh, you know, I'm sending my doctor a text, and my doctor will get back to me with a text later on, right? Do you guys use that terminology, synchronous versus asynchronous? New, new terms, newer way to think about it, or is that, yeah, we always we talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta make sure, because medical school itself is a, is a vocabulary uh, course, and, uh, and then transitioning to a, a digital health startup is, is also a little bit of that. Um, so a lot of predictions on uh, further adoption of telemedicine. I won't spend a ton of time on this just to make up a little bit of the time that we lost in the setup. But, um, but it's a very small industry. Beginning back in 2013 when I joined Dr. On Demand, and then I can see that the growth is starting to pick up, right? So the curve is starting to trend upward here, um, and with predictions of uh, users in the millions. Um, there are essentially four large companies that do electrification, or what's called electrification. Um, or direct-to-consumer telemedicine. Uh, are you guys familiar with terms like direct-to-consumer? So, um, so this is you know, so this is the, the way that we launched as a direct-to-patient company. Um, as I said, with three large competitors, and so obviously the goal of each company is to take off a certain amount of this. But really, you're really fighting over a small piece of pie. You think about all of the healthcare providers in this country, the millions of visits that, that are going to take place, really in the hundreds of millions. Um, there are plenty of medical, almost up to a billion, there are plenty of, of, of visits out there. And so the, the trend that I showed on the last slide with, with Kaiser showing how they're moving to over 50% of their care, being on some sort of digital means or telemedicine platform, um, is, is obviously something that I like to see. Um, but it's not just for business reasons, it's actually for other reasons as well. And for me, those reasons have always uh, revolved around the idea of around improving access to care, making sure that care is high quality, um, and then also that it's cost effective. So these are the these are the, the three objectives of most of our healthcare system, I'd say at this point, and the Affordable Care Act is to make sure that we find ways to more efficiently um, uh, deliver care and make sure that our physicians are able to do it, um, and, you know, use and leverage technology in a smart way. Why? I should probably say not just physicians, but you know, all healthcare providers, whether that's nurses, um, physicians, assistants, um, health coaches, and so on. It takes uh, a lot of different resources to actually make this happen. The goal of our company is to improve the world's health through compassionate care and innovation. Um, and, and that's, I think, how we, you know, if you had to boil that down to what does that look like, it looks like improving access, it looks like not compromising quality, and certainly it looks like uh, having to do it in a better way, cost-saving way, compared to how it's traditionally done, or what the status quo of medicine uh, is. And you guys have probably seen curves already that show you how the, the rising cost of health care, and it's pretty much not sustainable, everyone knows that. But we lack for a lot of explanations of what to do about it or how to solve that equation. I think telemedicine is a very logical, I think it will have to be part of the solution. And I think we'll have to move to the solution a lot quicker. So when I made my decision to leave Stanford as a faculty member, and well, at least teaching my courses, I'm still a faculty member, but teaching my courses and coming here every day and getting to see your shining, smiling faces, um, it was a really big decision for me, but I felt like it was one where that the impact that I'd be able to make would be big, and I felt that um, I felt I had a strong belief that promoting this type of platform and the leveraging te of technology in a smart way was something that had to be done. And if I did not take the opportunity to do that when I was recruited to join Doctor on Demand, that I would, you know, pretty much kick myself for the rest of my life afterwards. So I made that decision to do that. So how does how do you guys currently experience patient care? And I'll we'll, we'll cut this a little bit shorter than I had intended initially. But um, what happens when you need to when you need to see a doctor? Anybody, anybody, you guys look like a healthy group, but has anybody seen the doctor? Who's seen the doctor? As a patient. Okay, so almost everybody has done this. So how did you do it? How did you, how did you access care? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you can use an ambulance, and then, so if it's something urgent and, and you need it now, and you've waited up to the last minute to get care, and, and symptoms are getting severe, uh, you, yeah, you, you access an ambulance and you, and you go in. So that's one way to do it. And that's actually, I would call that, that's pretty on demand, right? Like that's an on demand way to access care. How, what, what's the non, on, not on demand way? What would you normally do? Because emergencies are emergencies, those are more rare. Obviously, we are all experiencing a pretty big emergency, uh, or we witnessed one 48 hours ago in Las Vegas. Um, but, um, but I think that it's a good example of how the system was prepared for that. I think they did a pretty good job of responding to it. At least that's what I've seen so far. It looks like they, they did about a good job of what they do. But that's emergencies, and those happen more rarely, hopefully. What about non emergent or non emergent? Yeah. Right. So make an appointment online, and I'm just repeating this for people who are who are abroad. So um, right, you make an appointment online, and you um, you figure out your insurance and whether that matches, right? And then you um, and then you wait for an appointment. Uh, or you know, and how long would you guys think is a reasonable wait for that appointment? Or how long do you currently wait for that? Is it weeks or days? Okay, so it could be one to five days if it's, if it's a primary care provider, but it could be longer, obviously, if you're trying to see a specialist. Um, average wait is across the country is about 18 days to see a primary care provider. Um, certainly can be shorter. We're in a pretty healthcare-rich environment right now here in you know, the RIFI Air Medical Center. Um, but, um, but I think that uh, for the average American, it's about 18 days for a wait. And so um, there's a lot of pain points here in, in how people access care. So. Uh, we talked about ER and urgent care. We talked about a little bit about the other places you can go, like an outpatient clinic. You make an appointment. You have to figure out what you're going to do about work. You all would have to figure out well, which classes am I going to miss. Um, do you have children? If you do, then you have to figure out what about child care. You'll have to navigate traffic, and then you've got to go sit in the waiting room, and you'll wait for the doctor to be, to be there. That makes sense, though, by the way, because that's probably the most efficient thing that we could do for healthcare right now was to, was to really... Um, if you think, if you take a step back and you think about the old model, doctors would go to patients' homes and deliver care, and then they figured out that that probably wasn't the most efficient way to do this, or there was more need for care, and there was more that doctors could do to help you. So what happened? They, so they, they they made health, they made clinics, hospitals, and the doctor sits there, and then you try to run the patients through as efficiently as possible, right? So that means on, on either side, somebody's going to be waiting, and it, and it makes sense that the doctor is there and the patient is waiting for the doctor to be available rather than the doctor waiting for the patient. Is that, is that just to go back to very much basics um, about supply and demand? Um, that's how it works, right? Somebody has to be waiting on someone else unless you have a perfect matching of supply and demand. So, um, so for on-demand services, now you can see the advantage of having, if you think about Uber or you think about what Dr. On-Demand does, we try to make sure that we compress the wait time down to minutes. So we have a three minute average wait time um, to which we will match you to a doctor. Um, and so that removes a lot of those pain points up there that you see at the top. And then also, again, um, we're doing this at a reduced cost. And you have to, you know, there's lots of business models that we can talk about about how to do that. Um, but what we try to do is make sure that the patient, one, knows that they have access, so we have to improve their awareness of that. And we did that by launching on national television. Um, we reduce the cost, so we try to lower the, the, the sort of sticker shock of well, what's my health care going to cost. And we try to provide them transparency. Know what the cost is of your health care so you can see what it is, you know what you're buying. I know that sounds like no duh, Uber tells me exactly what it's going to cost for my ride to get to X, you know, from A to B. But health care actually doesn't do that. Actually, right? Health care, if you try to figure out what you're going to be charged and what it's going to cost you specifically, it's actually pretty tough to figure out. And it gets, it's, got, it's wrong, like most of the time, or a lot of, not just most of the time, a lot of the time when you get your bill in this country, it's actually inaccurate. And you have to go back and and, um, and sort of advocate for yourself to, to correct that. And the healthcare system kind of knows that that's what happened, and it's kind of built that way, which is, which is a little bit um, stilted and unfair. Um, and then I mentioned this piece of lack of interoperability. So for a patient, what that means is my healthcare record that I, I, I went to Stanford, and my, and, but I'm actually a member of Kaiser, so I went to Stanford for my emergency that I had, um, but, but my clinic visit is actually normally at Kaiser, and those two systems don't usually talk to each other, so they don't know what was done at one place or the other. Which is a huge gap in here. So, uh, so this is what I was talking about. So, what did we uh, set out to do? So, we thought leverage, leveraging technology, leveraging mobile tech, uh, mobile tech, and the um, and then a physician uh, sorry nationwide physician workforce. We could actually do better with this wait time. We could reduce this from three weeks to uh, to three minutes. 
Um, so I would call that an innovation or a transformation. So some things are incremental change that you make when you jump from a three week or three, you go from, when you go from years to, to, you know, to, 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 to days or weeks, that's pretty incremental, right? You think about shipping things on a ship across the ocean versus flying them in a plane, all of a sudden you, trans, you can do the transatlantic transport within hours rather than within weeks. Um, same thing here, if you, um, you, know, if you, if you, if you can leverage this and build the workforce correctly and match supply and demand well, then you can actually achieve an average three minute wait time. But, how were you able to create the three-minute wait time? Yeah, so um, so a lot of our competitors would love to know, but basically <laughs> what it is is that we um, we we looked at the um, you know, some of the largest states, and um, we had the advantage of knowing that we could go out and um, and promote this on television, and so we were able to see adoption registration rates. And a lot of this is built into the product and the metrics that you that you. Um, that you collect through data. I can, give, I can collect a lot more data through someone accessing you through the phone, even down to where you're standing at the time that you make the call to, to see a, a doctor um, compared to a traditional healthcare system. So that's one. So you use data. Two, we use an employee physician workforce. And um, so with that, we have their attention, we have their engagement as providers, and so we were able to have them ready. So in a way, we have the doctor sitting and waiting if we don't deliver them volume. But the trick for us is to make sure we match those two things correctly. And the way we do that is that actually doctors have multi-state licenses. So that you're not a doctor sitting in the office that has to wait for a patient to get into the same room as them. So that's how we do it. That's not required in our model. We don't have to put you in the same place, the same geographic location. Doctor is remote, wherever, and then drawing patients from multiple different places. So that's how you keep the doctor busy. And uh, when you do it right, you balance it to the, to the demand, and you've been tracking that over time. You can, you can actually get it better and better. We've gotten it down to a pretty, a pretty good size. Yeah. Yeah. And do doctors have a lot of wait time, like waiting for people to get onto their system, or is it no, so no, efficient? No, I mean, it varies because healthcare does vary a little bit. Like right now, we're experiencing cold and flu season. That's a peak time for any health system. Um, but, um, but, um, but no, actually, we, again, that's just part of the secret sauce for us is to, is to know what time of year, what, uh, what day of the week, and what time of the day that people typically go to see healthcare. And so we know that, and we, and we, we track it down to the hour. Yeah? You can gain a reasonable piece of uh, better healthcare because you can probably see your patients who are given a distribution and a survey. Yeah, um, so I don't have a slide on it, but I can tell you that, uh, so about 75% uh, of our patient population are working females who have children. Um, they are between the ages of 30 to about 55. I mean, that's the biggest group. So that accounts for, you know, probably, again, like maybe 80% of the population. And then when you go out above 55 to 65, is about 10% of, of our patients are in that demographic, age demographic. <coughs> I think it's a little smaller, around uh, between 6 and um, to 8% for the next demographic up above that. And then, um, uh, and then going downwards, again, kind of tapers off at the end. Um, the severity of cases we launch, so that's that's the advantage of advertising. You launch and you communicate, to, you know, hopefully effectively in the awareness campaigns to let people know what they can come to you for. And so that was mostly urgent care conditions that we launched with in the first uh, two years. And then we added on mental health because we saw a lot of mental health cases coming in. Um, and we know there's a huge mismatch between supply and demand there. So we added behavioral health, so psychologists, and then psychiatrists um, uh, last year, or 2016. And um, and so, um, so the severity has moved from, from urgent care to including mental health, and now we just added labs. And so, in addition to that, we're actually seeing more chronic. Well, we're already seeing some chronic conditions come in, so we added labs so that we could, you know, we could do the audience for that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. The question there was, how have you targeted different populations with your with your product? Did you market to a specific demographic, either socioeconomic or so on? Um, we did. We went on that. It was on national television, and we did this through people who actually watched the Doctor Phil show or the Doctor Television show. So, <coughs> excuse me, I laugh, I cross, so I have to laugh. <coughs> um, so we uh, so with that launch, um, the watchers of that show was either some of demographic. It's actually primarily um, Caucasian or European Americans who watch those shows um, and who 
that needs a service. Um, I think there's quite a lot, it's quite a complex question about like who accesses healthcare and where they get their healthcare information. I would give one example in the African American community, people might be more likely to, to learn about something in the, I don't mean this to be stereotypical, but you know, they might learn about it in the barbershop, they might learn about it at church, um, um, and they might trust that information more than they're going to trust something that they can't see, um, if that makes sense. Because people consume healthcare differently, but um, no, I mean, that's one of my campaigns was certainly to, to, to appeal to the, um, in an effort to democratize healthcare, appeal to people who are more cost sensitive. Turns out that's not the only thing that people factor in, but we launched at a price of $40. The idea being anyone who could muster to get a $40 could get a doctor's visit. You didn't have to have insurance, you didn't have to have a job, if you needed health care, you could get it within three minutes and you had to have $40 to do this. Okay, let me um, move just a little bit. I was gonna show you guys a little bit of the product, but we are, let's start with, so um, I think I probably need to fly through this and just use these screenshots. Um, rather than walk you through a live demo, but I'm going to walk through. But just imagine on your phone how you get through uh, a number of apps. You take you through a different screen, and you're able to, with your thumb in one hand, be able to essentially give your, your history. You can use voice to text to, uh, to go ahead and deliver your, your, your history of present illness to the doctor. And then when you saw, and you can give us your past medical history, your cancer, diabetes, heart disease, so on. Um, and then you can rate the visit or rate the physician after the visit. And you can add that stuff to your favorites for follow up. So, Obviously, there's a number of other things in the product. If there's time in the q and I'll be happy to flash that up there. Maybe I'll walk through the product a little bit if that's okay for you guys. But in the interest of time, I wanted to give you a little bit of um, background on quality. So when you do this and you access, you offer people access or convenience, um, they might just use it because of that. And I think a lot of people who use this initially were just finding it very convenient. They had awareness of it. They had an urgent care problem. And they just said, like, I can get care really easy this way. It's worth the $40 and I'll go ahead and do it. Um, but um, but I don't. I think that we also want that people go along. Well, you know, again, they're not just price sensitive. They also don't want to compromise on quality. So um, and that is primarily my job is to make sure that we have outstanding um, quality in our uh, physician group. So what have we done? Well, we have physician ratings, which are nice, right? We have this the star rating, which is similar to how you you, know, you rate your your Uber your Uber ride um, or your Yelp meal. But, um, but I think that, um, but it actually is, is, there are some studies showing or trying to claim that, yeah, we, we can mimic um, um, patient satisfaction scores that are more traditional quality quality scores, which you guys don't even know the name of those, like every doctor at Stanford knows the press gaming, or they call it the stress gaming. Um, so ways to measure a physician's performance or a practice's performance. We've asked our doctors or, or our patients similar questions to those as well, not just using the five-star rating. And actually score pretty high, which is great. Um, we implemented an antibiotic stewardship program, knowing that a lot of patients who came to us, also knowing that one of the key criticisms of telemedicine would be that you could be a pill factory, but well, we addressed that by educating our doctors with six hours of continuing medical education to make sure that they didn't just hand over an antibiotic, but they actually were able to, to um, educate patients about, about when it's proper to use antibiotics and when it's not, and we've been able to reduce antibiotic prescribing in our practice 20%. And if you want to know how that compares to a typical in-office practice, we actually are able to beat the uh, national average for uh, in-office prescribing, and this has been reproduced um, in an audit that I'll, uh, I'll mention in a second. And then um, the way that you can do this is by having an engaged employed physician practice, right? So we, we've taken doctors, we employ them. So again, as I said, we get engagement, and I can get them to do this training at six hours of CME, um, uh, which is continuing medical education and antibiotic stewardship. Um, we engaged them in peer review programs, and uh, and then we also went for certain national accreditations to make sure that our practice was, you know, on the par on par with in office practices when it comes to quality. So we've done a number of things to to let people know, and hey, you know, this is this is this is a practice that's been evaluated the same way an in office practice is, and actually performing pretty well. For those that, that's for the people who care more about that. Some patients, again, like I said, convenience is enough, um, but we do a lot of work also to train our doctors how to talk to patients on a two-dimensional screen, what things you need to think about um, in verbal and nonverbal communication when you are when you are speaking to them because they might be certain they may be more sensitive to nonverbal cues on a telemedicine platform than they would be uh, if they were in the office. I'll just give one example. If I'm writing a note in the office, you see that I'm writing a note. If I'm writing a note on a two-dimensional screen and you don't know what I'm doing as a patient, you think that I'm distracted, I'm not, you know, I'm and so, you know, so a doctor would be trained in that case to say out loud, I'm actually going to, that's really important. I'm actually going to take a note on what you just told me because I think it's important. So I'm going to write that down right now. 
we would explain what we're doing there. It might seem subtle, it might seem obvious, um, but I think it's super important um, based on the feedback that we've seen. Just a couple more slides here and then I'll stop. So innovative practice. So um, you know, I think people like using technology. It's fun to uh, it's fun to be to be doing something that's new and and, um, and that hasn't been done before. And I certainly have got a lot of um, you know a, a strong sense of purpose and reward, a personal reward out of building things that no one's done yet. So it's kind of fun. So one we did was we added labs to our platform, as I said earlier this year. So we just launched that with two national laboratories, um, but we can add on more to the, uh, to the to the platform. All of this is integrated within the experience. So rather than having, if you think about it, rather than having to come out of one app and then go into another one, we've actually built it all in internal into our app. So it's one seamless experience that you can go through. You can get your lab order. You can see we use a geolocate um, component to be able to tell you where the local local labs are, the nearest labs are to you. You can go and get your lab done without ever having to go to the doctor's office. And then you can actually get the results as well, and they can talk to you and give you messages back and forth on what to do as a result of your lab. So, Vital signs a little harder, but this because this requires that patients either go on their own and buy uh, the the equipment. So this clinic cloud is a, um, a dual thermometer as well as stethoscope attachment for an iPhone um, or Android phone. Pretty nifty device, it works. It's, um, it's all what's, what's called asynchronous, so again, I can't have you do it right when I'm seeing you, but I can get the sounds, I can listen to the sounds. Um, not high, highly utilized, but a really uh, er, good early FDA approved option for having this kind of idea of a hospital at home for a patient. Um, so that was really for the early adopters, but, um, but it's an integration that we did to show that we could do it and to learn from the experience. Um, and finally, physical examination, this is something I won't say a lot about today because there's only a couple of medical students in the room for this talk, but, uh, but again, just rethinking and unlearning what you learn in medical school, which is important, but then you have to kind of retool it or, or interpret that to be able to translate to, uh, again, what you can do on a two-dimensional screen um, and what inter information that you can gather to build your differential diagnosis and make a diagnosis. I mentioned this audit. Uh, this, is, this was done by a third party. Um, uh, and it basically just shows our performance um, with, uh, with a, in, a, in a health plan. Um, and as I said, we were able to outperform uh, the in-office practice on antibiotic prescribing rate, 14 days uh, revisit uh, rate after same diagnosis. Uh, so really almost identical or outperforming and at a much lower cost than, um, than uh, in-office practice. Um, I'll speak to, well, I'll just say about this slide and I'll stop, which is that um, kind of went through a quick run through here of one, the patient experience, um, how you might approach that, uh, what some of the things that Dr. Man did to really reinvent the experience that a patient would have, everything from, well, how do I get an appointment to see it and, 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 and get into the office to when well, we've eliminated those things, which, you know, by leveraging technology has made some of that easier to do. And so now what we're focusing on is really beginning to build around, um, around the platform that we already have and beginning to bring in partnerships from outside of Doctor on Demand to really create the entire pa uh, patient care journey. Whether that means uh, diagnostics or whether it means um, the pharmacy delivery, um, whether it means using or partnering with, uh, with patient navigators, uh, and there are companies that do this. All of which, um, you know, exists because traditional primary care and uh, healthcare system the way it's currently constructed and, and, um, and organized is um, yeah, it's, it's difficult enough for people to engage. It's, it, it lacks convenience and lacks access. Um, so, so all these different companies, including Dr. Arman, on Demand, have really sprung up to really fill the gap that already exists within the system. Um, and so, I just want to give you guys kind of a more holistic picture of like what, is, what's, what else is up in there and how do you do it. Um, I think I'll stop there and just uh, maybe say some particular questions. Okay. And then we'll see if I can uh, mirror my screen when we um, talk about that as well. Uh, again, I have to say I'm personally extremely impressed with uh, what you have done with your leadership uh, with Doctor On Demand. Uh, it has dramatically improved its presence and, and you know, what your the value propositions that you have uh, for everyone. Uh, just to start some questions, I have a question for you. <laughs> what do you think it's, it's been the biggest Success, but most importantly, the biggest favor that you guys have had if you have experienced any along the way. Yeah, good question. So, you know, biggest success, I would say, probably has to do with uh, 
the doctor patient relationship. One thing that I didn't know, um, or I wasn't sure of, and having taught this uh, here at Stanford in the medical school, and how important that is to be able to be in the room, make eye contact, and do all the things that, that you need to do to, uh, to establish that relationship. I was unsure about our ability to do that on, on a physical platform. The patient's on a cell phone, and they're moving around, and the doctor is, you know, how many know how many states away, or time zones. Um, and so I'm really um, pleased to see that patients make comments about the doctor, they, they use the doctor by, you know, call out the doctor by name, say that they would like for that doctor to be their primary care physician. Um, so that was probably the biggest victory, because I think, to me, that's one of the most important things that happens when it's a doctor and a patient in a room together, is that you can make that connection. So that's probably the most important thing that we were able to achieve. Um, you know, the biggest, I think you said, the error or failure that we may have experienced uh, you know, I think as you grow, um, I don't know, if you can, you know, sometimes you can have failures that are, are due to success, you know, and, and I've learned that that's actually expected now, but that was pretty new to me, right? Like, you know, success to get success when you're, you know, when you're a good student and, you, you know, you try really hard and you work hard and you, you, get, you get rewarded with good grades and you get rewarded with opportunities and they make you get into medical school and so on. Um, in, a, in a company that's growing from small to large, or mid-size, I should say. Um, you know, there are there are things that happen when you're successful that, um, and I'll give an example where there are people who are like, well, super important to help you get there. But you, if you don't pay attention to developing them and and, um, and and growing them for the next phase of that company, you might you might not be able to retain them. You might lose them either because they decide to leave or because they don't they no longer fit the job that, that you hired them for. So I, I, it's not a it's not a failure because I think you kind of earn that growth, but it's, I'm mentioning it because I think it's something really important to think about it for me because again I I develop relationships with all those people and so you know we've had um, we've had a, a few people that just that that's happened to I said that just didn't you know, no longer fit where we were going or what was happening or their job changed enough that it just felt um, you know it felt like a slightly different job and maybe they didn't want to they didn't want to do anymore so so those are Well, one, two, and then you can be third. Uh, no, you go first, and then. The CEO? Yeah. Yeah. Of how much healthcare experience they had, did they have a healthy respect for physicians? And 
Um, and the, really the, some of the core values that I think that exist within a doctor-patient relationship. And so I saw that in our CEO, and I think so did our board and the other members of our team when we were going through that process. And so um, I'm really confident that we have the right, the right person and the right mix. And I actually like, in a way, I'll be selfish and, and you know, from a practical standpoint, but as a doctor who sees himself or still aspires to be a doctor, doctor, um, I wanted someone who actually didn't have as much healthcare background in a way because sometimes doctors, but this again, we could have a CEO who's a doctor. Sometimes doctors who, who have a business background or who have made that transition completely, they may, you don't know what their background is or what their baggage is, and sometimes they are, they are um, not as, um, you know, not as strong believers in, in some of the things I think that, that I might value. Uh, and so I've experienced that myself, and so for me, it was really seeing the, what are the core values, and rather than what, what is your industry. Yeah. Um, so, so that's one. And then the other question was, you know, career-wise, and how do you end up, you know, going or making a transition from Stanford faculty into a company and then and, and maintaining your faculty position? I can talk to you offline about that a little bit because I think it is interesting. But, um, but I think this is a great place. I mean, the environment here, you all have exposure to things that, it, that medical students and undergraduates and um, and healthcare professionals in other parts of the country really don't have exposure to. The hubs are growing, they're becoming more multiple because there's such a thirst and demand, right? So in Pittsburgh it's happening and in Austin, Texas it's happening. So, but this is really the first place I would say that it really happened when you had healthcare uh, innovation and integration with, um, with, with startup companies beginning. And so I kind of feel like it will look back at some point and realize that we experienced a little bit of a rebirth or, or renaissance, hopefully, um, that... Um, that, that gave you guys opportunities that you wouldn't have otherwise had, but also offered distractions that you would have otherwise avoided, right? Like, so what I would say is I have been very focused through my, and I don't know if this is really the question you were asking, but I think it's worth saying, which is that I was pretty focused on being a good student, being a good uh, uh, teammate, uh, being a good um, doctor, then being a good, you know, being a good resident, the chief resident, a, a, a good doctor, a good educator, I just focused on each of those things along the way, and what I have found is that each of those pieces of my career or my trajectory, I'm, I mean, I'm relying heavily on them in my role now. And so what I would say is that training that I've gotten through my path has been like outstanding training to be able to do that. And I don't know the answer of like whether I'm balancing it well enough yet to say whether I'll, you know, do I maintain my faculty of I have up to now, but. But, you know, but I'm here less. Um, I'm obviously honored to be asked back and come and talk with you guys, but, um, but there's no doubt that there is a world outside of, of the Stanford health system. I started as being a Dean, uh, you guys didn't hear that. <laughs> you might have But, um, no, but to be serious, you know, it's, it, there, it really is. And so, um, so I think part of the decision making is not all mine, but it's also on the institution to decide well, how much, can, how far can we let our faculty drift? Because how badly do we need new ideas to come back? Can we listen to them or can we not? And that's not a value judgment of the individuals in leadership position. It's actually a commentary, I would think, of the health system and what it affords them. And so, right, this institution has to stay alive, it has to survive, it has to stay focused to do that. And so it might mean they have to play a certain um, play a certain role in a community, like a quaternary healthcare center, and that might sometimes be in conflict with like letting your faculty just fall off field. So kind of a complex answer, but I mean you I think you, you, you know where I'm like. No, oh, I understand. Yeah. 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 Could you uh, explain <coughs> a little bit last, last class how uh, medicine uh, is very difficult to scale? You yeah. have a very limited practice. And unless you're at a position like you, with leadership and with a company that uh, you can fully scale through uh, information and communication technologies, you can bring it to the masses. Right. Right. Like the Stanford doesn't have a 50, a 50 state plan, but if they wanted to have one, yeah. I think they would, should be calling me because I've been developed, like that's what I've been working on for the last four years. So, so, um, so I think, uh, you know, I guess I'll give myself my commercial. I should be a value to Stanford to stay, but uh, you know, it's <laughs> totally up to them, um, you know, but it, it's, but it's been a great partnership. And, um, and I think just to go back to the, the, the common thread there is like, I wasn't focused on developing this part of my career. It happened because I wanted to be good, I think, at each stage. And that both compare me to what I'm doing now, and I hope it feeds back to, to you know, bringing that value to Stanford, that's probably why I'm here today, so I can talk about that. Let me, let me jump, I know that, so let me get your question, and then you, you run the front, and then there's others. But yeah, I'm just talking. Okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the idea of working with faculty, because those are amazing, and Dr. Hamilton, and Dr. Hamilton, Yes.
Oh, that's great. Yeah, I forgot that, that I didn't. Yeah, I didn't give that part of yeah. So I missed that. So the, comp, the questions are good and they're complex. So I didn't get to every part of it. Yeah. Yeah, are we fulfilling that mission or right? right. Are we walking the walk or are we just talking the talk? No. Um, so yeah, no, great question. Are we you know are we reaching the populations that we intended? My my past career was homeless veteran outreach and actually a rural a rural veteran outreach program, which is where I was introduced to telemedicine. So that's the history of telemedicine. Actually the way it was rationalized, because the assumption was that it was going to be less lower quality or second rate quality. But it was okay because it was getting to people who otherwise would have no health care. So, therefore, that was the rural population. So that was part of the rationale for um, for bringing in um, telemedicine and allowing it to be reimbursed and so on in general. But no, I think it's evolved a lot, and I don't even think about it anymore in terms of rural and urban. And I'll tell you why: because patients that are rural, yes, they lack geographic, they have geographic isolation, but technology actually is eliminating a lot of that. So we have rural, I have, I don't know the demographic of rural patients, I mean, we could probably look that up, because we know we've, we've delocated all of those. But our patients come from all over the country right now, um, all 50 states, including Alaska and, and Hawaii. Um, and I can take international calls, too. I mean, we can, we can do that if we wanted to. So um, so, so I think the, the power of the tool is just, we're just learning about it, for, for one. The other thing is there's more than just geographic isolation, there's your job. And healthcare is typically is offered in work hours, um, other than urgent cares or ERs, or in and I'll use Texas as a, as a use case, um, which are like private ERs that charge super high prices for you to go in because they know that they've got you. I mean, you, you're trapped. You know, you, you can't go anywhere else. So they're there and they have huge prices because they, they know that they can stay to you if you need them. And so, um, so what I would say there is it's very difficult for that working mother that I described in our demographic to get off of work, find their childcare, to be able to have the time to go and find us. So luckily for them, we're 24-7, and, on the, uh, and so that means we're available on the weekends, we're available from their office, or they just need to get into the location room and do a call. So we are offering uh, access to care, not just to the rural, but also the urban who, lack, who just lack um, time and availability to actually see a provider. Um, most of our care is around urban centers. I think that's just where technology starts to kind of branch out from, but I'm happy to say that we're pretty pretty broad. Um, are we hitting the, um, so we moved, so for cost, direct to patient used to be 70% of our population. Now it's much more, you know, now it's, we've, we've kind of flipped, and now we're like more like 65% um, people with insurance or an employer who's paying for their care. So that's just, I think that just happens over time. It becomes, we, We've acquired more clients and more health plans have said, hey, we want to partner with you guys. And so, um, so that's just been a big part of our growth. But um, we have raised our price to $75. Um, it's, it's, um, I'm a little torn about that. But honestly, I know that it's still, that's still half the price. So what it will cost you to go, or maybe less, to go into an office practice. Um, as I showed on there, I mean, actually, it could be even much cheaper, you know, in some, in some cases, uh, and in office practice, maybe even 4X or 5X, what I would have seen that there's a lot. I answered a lot of those questions. I don't know if I answered every single one of them. Maybe I'll take another one and then we'll move we'll up. Uh, this, this, are we at time for this book? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Well, maybe one more question, and, I will, and I'll give a short answer. Okay, it's actually, this is one from the Philippines that was typed in. Okay. So um, a, que a question from a student asked, what is the average consultation time on doctor in demand? Oh, great, nine minutes. Sorry, great one, easy one. So the average conversation is about nine minutes, um, and we see patients, we ask patients about the, how much time did the doctor spend with you, and in general, uh, over 92% of our patients say that the doctor, that they mark on, yes, the doctor, yeah, yes, I agree, the doctor spent enough time with you. So it's kind of interesting, because um, in my 20 minute appointment at clinic, patients might say, hey, you know, the doctor didn't spend enough time. But so I think we've learned that it's how we're spending the time. It's different than it is in an office practice. There's fewer distractions, fewer things to worry about, um, fewer, you know, less overhead. The doctor is literally looking at the screen, sees the EMR on the screen and the patient, and they're in the same place. And so the doctor is you know, just far less distracted. I think the patient is picking up on it. All right, okay, thank you for, thank thank you you. for the questions. Sorry we didn't have more time, but um, hopefully that was a decent introduction to you all. So, thanks for that. <laughs> You look and sound very happy, so I think that's what yeah. I'm Despite the cold, uh, you know, I'm getting over it, yeah, I am.